Welcome back to Mastering Next.js. In this module, we're going to be talking about state management and more. So first we'll talk about Redux, then we'll talk about React Context and how they differ, which one you would use, how to add TypeScript to any Next.js application, and then finally we'll end with dynamic imports. So first, let's talk about Redux. You've probably heard of Redux. It is a predictable state container for JavaScript applications. So it's not just for React. It works with other frameworks, but it has definitely gained its popularity through the React ecosystem. Now, why is Redux a thing? You probably at some point in scaling your application needed to share state across different pieces of the application. And you can do that to an extent by doing state inside of components, but depending on the scale of your application, you might need to have a global state. And really the root cause of what introduces something like Redux or like React Context or other state management um, libraries, you know, the need for a global state is this notion of prop drilling. So if we look on the left, Imagine that you have some data coming into your application. When you are prop drilling, you are essentially forwarding that data down from the top to the child, to the child, and so on and so forth, passing that through as props to the components that need it. Now, when you have a simple application, this isn't that big of a deal, but as things start to grow and you're five, 10 levels of components deep, because ideally you want to have you know small, reusable components, um, you're going to more easily run into this situation where you're passing this data down deeper and deeper and deeper. And that is where solutions like Redux and Context came into play that allowed you to have this single global data source and then allow you to access that data at different places inside of your application. So that's really the root problem of what caused Redux to be created. But then over the past you know, three to four years, as it's gained a lot of popularity, there's also been a bunch of middleware built on top of Redux that makes it even easier to manage that state. So I think at that point, you started to see new applications spin up that just used Redux right away. And it almost became this buzzword where people weren't thinking about, okay, do I need to add Redux to my project? What is the scale? Am I gonna be needing to have this global state? So the biggest thing that I want to preach is that before you use Redux, you have to ask yourself first, does your app even require to have a global state? Could component level state or a top level component state satisfy your use case without getting crazy into prop drilling? Nonetheless though, if you do have to use Redux or your team has already adopted Redux, uh, I think it's really important to follow the best practice from the Next.js maintainers on how to implement Redux in your application because it has changed over the past six months. So if I jump into this example with Redux on the Next.js repository, what used to happen was you would override the underscore app page so that you could make a container around all of your pages when you initialize them and that is where you would provide the store. But in the process of doing that, we were overriding get initial props at that app level. Now the problem with this, and there's still a lot of Redux examples that do this using Next.js, is that it opts your application out of using static pre-rendering. So if two of your pages use Redux and maybe five others are marketing pages and they don't need to, they're effectively not gonna be able to compile down to a static site, and that's that's not great. So we wanna get around that. So as of recently, the best practice for how to use Redux with Next.js has changed a little bit. So I'm gonna show this quick example here. We set up a really simple store that has the ability to increment, decrement, and reset some value, and we're setting this up at the root level of the store. Now when you're consuming this on a page by page basis, you get to choose whether you wanna wrap the application in this with Redux higher order component. So if you do, 
that opts that component out of static pre-rendering and it says, okay, I want to tap into that global store so that I can use the Redux hooks to not only pull things off of the store, but also dispatch actions to update the store. So again, this is important because it means that you can still have static pages and that you don't need to always be calling get initial props on an app level basis. So this with Redux library that they provide, it's kind of complicated, but essentially what it's doing is ensuring that you're only using it at a page level. So you can't do this higher order component um, on a component by component level. It has to be at the top. And it's making sure that you don't call it at an app.js level. And then finally, it's essentially calling the get initial props and making that store available. So now on that page, you're able to tap into that store as well as any sub components on that page that need to dip into the store to pull values off or to dispatch actions. Now, one other thing I will mention is that if you really needed the functionality of, of rendering out to a static site, you can always dispatch on the client side in Git or on component did mount instead of get initial props. So that's basically how you would do it in a non Next.js land, right? You would wait until that component has mounted on the client side and then start to fetch that information or dispatch those actions. So that's still an option too. But overall, I would say my recommendation would be to not use Redux. I think that there's definitely a time and place for using it. Uh, and there are some pros, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. But more often than not, at least from my experience, um, it's very easy for things to get out of control with Redux. And they've started to, to change how they propose this. Now they have a Redux toolkit, which is a little bit more opinionated in how you should implement it. But I still think that more often than not, the built-in solutions that come with the library are going to satisfy your use case more often than not. So that is the React Context API. This was introduced in React 16.3, I believe, mostly as a response to seeing how the community was using React, seeing that so many apps were being built with global stores and they needed the ability to share that state across different pages and they wanted to get around the prop drilling or passing data down from parent to children. So context allows you to do that without having to pass props. So it's pulling data off of that global store. Again, very similar idea to Redux, just implemented in a different way. And especially with Next.js specifically, you can wrap specific components with a context provider and you don't have to do it at a page level like you do with the with Redux higher order component that I just showed. So why would I use React Context and why would I use Redux? So in my opinion, the big pros of Redux where you might need to use it, uh, it comes with some pretty nice dev tools um, that can do a lot of really robust functionality. To be honest, I haven't really used this a lot and I work on a pretty large scale project that uses Redux, um, but it, it is there if you need to do it. Um, so you can trace your state updates, you can um, have a bunch of pre-baked middleware just pull off the shelf and NPM install away that allows you to add more logic on top of your state management solution. That's just not something that you can do as easily with React Context, although you do have the ability to pull in custom hooks. If you need Redux to help with data fetching, like you're, you're dispatching actions to then get a response back from some kind of REST API, uh, in my opinion, I would recommend moving towards GraphQL and Apollo because that will completely circumvent the need to do any of that logic. The Apollo client will be able to make those requests for you, cache that data, and you can completely you know, remove the need for Redux in that case. Now, to take it even a little bit further, you can replicate some of the functionality with Redux using a use reducer hook that's provided by React. Um, but 
again, there's not that time travel debugging, which is what you get with the Redux dev tools. So you can see how your state changes across time. You don't get the middleware. You don't get some out of the box performance optimizations that Redux provides. But personally, I've never used the time travel functionality, so I can't speak too much about it. Now, if performance is really, really important and you're working on a really large app that has lots of state changes, then maybe Redux is worth using. But personally, uh, React Context has worked really well for me. And to show an example here, we're doing something very similar by increasing account but the amount of code needed to do it is much smaller in the context API example because it's built into React and it's part of that API. Now, like I said, there are trade-offs, but overall, I think that React context, the use context hook, the use reducer hook, um, and changing your model about how you build these applications and, and share state will probably work for most people up to a point. And when you get to that point, then it might be worth evaluating whether you need to use a more robust library like Redux. But what I'm preaching is don't just do it because I read this article from Dan and he said that, you know, I should use Redux or I saw on Twitter that a lot of people are using Redux. You need to really evaluate how and what your application needs. So you'll see that we set up a component that is a counter and we're providing two hooks into our context. So pulling the count off and then dispatching an action to update what is in that global store. And the syntax for React context, essentially you set up the context, you make what your reducer is or what's gonna be held inside of that context, and then you have providers that you can access the value of that global store. It's kind of the same thing as with Redux needing to wrap the top level so that you can provide that store. You do the exact same thing with React Context at a, a top level, whether that's the entry point into your application or the component that you want, you're going to wrap it with that provider so that you can get access to that store. Now, in my opinion, this is all great, but it's kind of hand wavy and I didn't really understand it until I saw an example of, okay, I'm using React State I hit a wall and now I need to go to React Context. And I'm gonna show an example of that so that you know kind of what that looks like in the real world. So in the Daydrink application, you have the ability to search for deals. And when I started, this was all I had. That was the only functionality I had for searching or filtering. So you'll see here that I made this search context it had the search value in state, it had an ability to update that value, and then it passed that information as a prop down to the header component so that you could type things in, receive that value, and then essentially it just rendered all other children below it. So this got used at the app.js level and the entire application was rendered inside of the search context. So Everywhere in the application, I had it wrapped with this header and I could tell what the search value was. Now this worked really good for a while until I started to add more filtering and searching logic and I wanted to have it all in the same store. So if you look on the left, not only can we search, but we can also change locations if there were more in the database. We can change the day that the deals are shown and we can also filter the type of deal. So maybe I only want food. Now I wanted all of these values to be contained in the same store. And that broke down because there were multiple places in the application that were not necessarily directly underneath that um, top level component where the header was that needed to pull that value off of the state. So I ended up making a context provider so that I could tap into the search value. And just to show an example, over here on the right, I'm gonna get into what this does, but I am able to access it by the use search hook. And if I search for this, you'll see that I can access it in a bunch of different places now. So on a page, I'm using it here to pull off 
what day of the week I have selected, what the search value is, what type of filters I have. Here, I'm only pulling off the search value. Here, just the day of the week so that when I am clicking up or down, I can know what that is when I make my mutation to GraphQL to update that data. Inside of the actual filter component, uh, at the app level, so that I can pass that into the header. And this is replicating what we were doing before. So now I have this hook that I can use in a bunch of different places without having to prop drill or pass it around. I can simply just access into that global state and have everything self-contained in one nice consumable spot. So let's go back to this and start talking about what it looks like. So the first thing we do is we create a context for the search context. Next, we set up a provider that's going to make the values that are available in this context able to be accessed. And then we make a use search hook that you can consume inside of your components such that you can get the context. And that was the example I just showed of how we actually access this. So now, inside of here, this is the meat and bones of what the React context what this global store is providing for us. So I put a couple things into state, the search value, the day of week, the filters that I have selected, they're able to be stored here. Plus I have these methods that allow me to update those values. So just changing the values in state or doing some other filtering logic, replacing values. And then I'm able to export not only the current values, but also the functions that allow us to update this value in state. So it's really not that different than a component state and having that at the top level. The difference is that instead of having to pass those props around everywhere, I can use it from any point in the application. So it doesn't matter if I'm here. It doesn't matter if I'm here. It doesn't matter if I'm way down here, you know, 10 child components deep. I can jump into that context really easy, and it just makes for a more maintainable code. Okay, so that is a example of how you would use React Context, um, and hopefully you understand why you might use that instead of Redux. Another nice thing about React Context is if you don't wanna have just one massive global store, you can also have multiple providers um, that you can wrap only specific components in your application with so that you can kind of segment up that store to only the piece of the application that needs it. There's a similar context with Redux, but I overall I feel that the React context library that ships with React does a pretty good job of replicating almost everything that you're gonna need for most applications. So that's React context. Now let's jump into how you would add TypeScript to your application. So TypeScript is JavaScript that scales. Basically, from what I've heard, it's called enterprise JavaScript. And which is, you know, it's funny, but it is kind of true because there's a certain scale of application where you really see the benefits of TypeScript. And I think that's when it makes sense to adopt it because there is a little bit of a learning curve with bringing people up to speed, but it's a type superset of JavaScript that compiles down to JavaScript. So you're not exactly learning a completely new language, but you are learning new features on top of JavaScript. So there is a little bit of a barrier of entry, but I think once you get used to it, it's really not that bad. And overall, it provides more confidence in your code as you're doing refactoring or other large changes um, it is not a replacement for testing, but it also, um, like I said, just gives you more confidence in your code. And I think we're seeing a lot of people start to adopt this. The trend is rising very, very fast. And because of that, Next.js has made it really, really easy to add TypeScript to your application. So I've actually got the diff of everything that I need to do to add TypeScript already coded out so that you don't have to watch me do it. And essentially it's as simple as making a TS config file. It can be empty. And when you run the application the next time, Next is gonna recognize that and say, hey, it looks like you wanna use TypeScript. 
Um, you're going to need to install a few things, which I've done. So I installed TypeScript and I also installed the types for React. Then when I run the application for the first time, Next.js will automatically populate this tsconfig file. I didn't have to do anything. So that's awesome because in my opinion, this is one of the more daunting parts of getting set up with things like TypeScript. It's, you know, what do all these things do? I'm not really sure. But the nice thing about them, you know, auto filling this out is now as I get more into the weeds, I have the ability to change things here and not be kind of locked into an ecosystem. I can change things as I need. Another thing that Next.js does for you is it creates this next env file and this is at the root of your project and it basically ensures that the types for Next.js are picked up by TypeScript. So don't delete this file, pretty much just leave it and it will allow you to have access to Next.js specific types. So our application set up with TypeScript, that's really all we needed to do. The next step is basically just renaming a file from JS to TSX. So I have a really simple example here where I've taken the props that I pass in and I've said, I wanna define this as a type. And I made a new interface at the top specifying specifically what the type of these props are. So name is a string, address is a string. We have an array of deals and then the image URL is a string too. Now you could get crazy with this you can do a lot with TypeScript, but I'm not gonna go into the weeds on the specifics of TypeScript. More so, I wanna to touch on how it integrates with Next.js. So overall, if you need to use TypeScript, it's gonna work exactly the same as you've done it in other JavaScript projects, um, but you do have the ability to pull off these next specific types. So if you wanna type uh, a specific page, you can do that. If you wanna um, type a React component, you can do that. If you're building API routes, they also provide types for the request and the response. And then even the custom app.js level, they provide you the props that get passed in. So all the types for the custom Next.js specific things that you need to do are provided so that you don't have to create those yourselves. But other than that, TypeScript, it's just gonna function exactly the same as it would with any other JS or TS project. So getting set up with TypeScript is actually really, really easy. Now, one other thing I wanna to touch on is code generation. So if you're using GraphQL, which I 100% recommend, and you know, you know went down this route of building an application that's using GraphQL and Apollo, you can actually use TypeScript and GraphQL to automatically generate all your types based on your GraphQL schema. Now I've seen this, I've used it before, and it is just mind-blowingly amazing because more often than not, when we go back to this example over here on the right, this bar props is mimicking some model that's in our database, right? There's a location model that holds all this information and I just had to write the type myself. So if I could automatically get these types created through my GraphQL schema and they would be up to date whenever that schema changes, it saves you so much time in the long run versus having to define all these things yourself. So if you're going down the road of TypeScript, GraphQL, which I recommend, um, you should definitely look into this because it will save you a lot of time, especially if you're using Hasura. Now, the final thing that I wanna talk about is dynamic imports. And this is a pretty small use case. I don't think a lot of people will be using this, but I wanted to just throw it in here so that you know about it. Um, dynamic imports allow you to load a specific JavaScript application or bundle at runtime. So I've used this in the past for performance reasons. There, maybe there's something that I want to load, but I don't want to be part of that initial page load. So I import it on demand. Or there's also been times where uh, a third party library that I tried to use didn't work very well with server side rendering. and server-side rendering was a requirement for the page that I was trying to build. So I needed to import dynamically and I needed to turn off server-side rendering. Uh, an example of this up until recently was the React Select component. Just didn't really work well with server-side rendering. The styles were messed up. So I had to import it this way, turn off server-side rendering, and then everything was okay. So 
this is more of a good to know if you need to do this type of custom behavior, um, know that it's built into Next.js, but it is definitely an advanced feature. So we've talked about Redux, we've talked about React Context, how to add TypeScript, so easy. The Next.js team has done an amazing job there. And then finally touched on what dynamic imports are and when you might need to use one. Uh, hopefully you understand the landscape of JavaScript global state now and can really do a thorough evaluation on when I should use Redux, when I should use context, or even some of the other third-party global state management solutions and you know make the best choice for your app's requirements and the you know the experience of the people on your team. So with that, thanks for tuning in and stay tuned for the next final module. Cheers.